Let I'm me just me. let me just say uh, let me just say welcome and thank you for uh, thank you for coming. This is good. Um, and do you want to just introduce yourself, Marnell, in terms of uh, you know your name, uh, your your kind of brand, how long you've been coaching this type of thing? All right. Um, my name is Marnell Sample. Some of you may know me as Dante, depending on where you met me at. I go by both names. Um, I've been teaching now for 11 years. Um, I am interested in most styles of music, just about every style of music except for metal. Metal is like the one thing I never really got into, but just about everything else I love from pop, R&B, soul, gospel, blues, country, rock, classical music, opera. Um, I, I basically love the whole gamut of things. I love flamenco music. I'm getting into, you know, Latin jazz and things like that. So um, <clears throat> I coach singers on all of these styles of music. I am a vocal technician primarily, meaning um, for those who don't know the difference between a vocal coach and a vocal a voice teacher or a vocal technician, a, a vocal coach is someone who works on style with you. So teaching you when it's appropriate to use this type of color versus this other type of color. When is it appropriate to sing louder or softer? <clears throat> when it's appropriate um, when certain stylistic elements are appropriate or just simply what are the stylistic elements of a particular style of music versus another style of music. That's normally what a vocal coach works on with you. I do some of that too because I am familiar with these styles, but I'm primarily a vocal technician. That's someone who teaches you how to sing louder, how to sing softer, how to sing your high notes, how to get, um, how to get rid of strain, how to sing longer phrases, basically all the hows. That's what a vocal technician does. And that's primarily what I do and what I've been trained to do. Um, I've gone to school for speech pathology, so that's what my degree is in. So I have that background, too. And that influences a lot of how I approach things. Mm, I didn't realize you've been teaching 11 years, dude. Um, that's, uh, that's a while. I mean, I've been teaching about, I guess, five, I, I'd say, kind of... Uh, in terms of actually doing lessons with people um mm -hmm. and i mean I've, i'm in my mind i'm like maybe about halfway to where i want to get to in terms of um what i see in my mind um also um i really liked what you said just here about this idea of having style coaches and more technical coaches because I, I feel like eventually there's probably going to be a sent uh, a case that that a, that a singer may well begin to go to a a pure you know a, a pure kind of te technical kind of coach, and then a style coach for their singing, because yes. a, I'm I'm primarily on the the technique side. I mean, whilst uh, and that's mostly because I, I I knew in my head what I, what stylistically what I wanted to do when I came into singing, um, mm -hmm. and I just needed to, technically to figure out how to do it. So most of my stuff is geared towards that and I enjoy coaching that with people because it's the stuff that's more, it can run a bit deeper into people, styles mm. a little bit more, I guess I'd say shallow, but only in the sense of, um, you know, it's, it's just a, it's a different kind of thing. It's not, um, it, it's, I don't even know if shallow is the right word, but it, it, it I don't, I feel like it's, it's more the details on top, whereas the, the technical stuff and that deeper stuff is, is the stuff that really has been interesting me. Um, and did you say you had, did you say you had a degree or what was this voice patholo yes. pathology? Speech pathology. Speech. Yes. Because, um, um, yes, my degree is in speech pathology. So that's why, and I almost had like a pre-med degree too. I was planning on going to medical school. That's a, to become an ENT, but that's another story. Uh. <laughs> so that's why I have a lot of the scientific and technical background within the voice because I have all of those, you know, um, science classes and courses and courses in anatomy and courses in, um, um, what is it called? Human development. Because, because a lot of times people will hear me, especially if you work with me, I'll start speaking of things in terms of human development. So I base my lessons off of trying to mimic human development patterns and applying that to voice and applying that to music learning. And, um, 
Yeah, so I have a lot of that background, but then I also, I would say my primary background when it comes to teaching, even though I do have that, is more so from, um, uh, with my main teacher that I worked with, Bedine Magaziner. She was an SLS, SLS coach, teacher, and I trained primarily with her. I studied for her. Once I sat and figured out how many hours it was, it turned out that it was over 400 hours that she spent teaching me how to coach other singers that I spent observing her. So what I would do is um, once I started first learning um, about technique, I became inter more interested in, in really understanding how this worked and why it worked. And at first it was more so just for personal reasons, because this, this gets into a little bit of my background story. Um, we'll get into that in a second, I guess, whenever you're ready. But um, mm. I was curious as to why I was not picking up the technique as fast as I knew I should have. It was like, intellectually, I seem like I'm getting it, but 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 what, am I just missing something? So what I did is I asked my teacher one day, I said, do you mind if I like sit in and just watch a couple of other, pe other people's lessons? And she said, sure. And she's like, as long as the student is okay with it, you're more than welcome to sit and stay. And that was only meant to be just, you know, something I was just gonna do, you know, just for a couple of lessons, but then it ended up turning into a regular thing to where because she taught in New Jersey and New York City half the time. She was in New Jersey three days out of the week and then in New York City the other four days out of the week. Well, I'm not traveling to New York City every day. This is when I was living in Philadelphia. So to drive from Philly to New York, for people who are not familiar with that part of the country, that's a two-hour drive. From Philly to where she lived at in New Jersey, that's a 30-minute drive. So that was you know, more feasible for me. I would go three days out of the week to watch her teach anywhere from five to eight hours a day. So... I was seeing a lot of different students coming in in all different styles of music. She had people doing pop, R&B, um, classical music, because even though she was an opera singer, she had all these different styles. She um, worked with people doing musical theater. She worked with all all age ranges, anywhere. Some Her youngest student that I saw was seven years old. Her oldest student was this doctor. He was in like his 70s or something like that. So I got to see like a, a wide range of things. I got to see people who had vocal damage, people with normal voices, people with like all types of stuff. And that was literally the best training I ever could have gotten. Yeah, that's awesome, man. You know, um, that kind of mirrors some of my experience, not as not as direct with myself, but when I when I was learning all this stuff, the Singing Success Online website came around which was and later that became singing success tv which is kind of defunct now but it was when jesse nemitz was on board at singing mm -hmm. success and and they had like two or three times a week they would be putting lessons up so mm -hmm. i would just spend you know hours and hours watching these lessons and i'd say i don't know probably half my knowledge comes from at least the, the building blocks of what i do now came from watching hours of, of them teaching mm -hmm. um and I, I thought it would actually be a lot easier to teach myself when I started. I've realized um, over the years that it's it's very hard, even when you know a lot of stuff, because you just, um, you've got to have, I think there's no real replacement for just grinding away lots of hours teaching. Yes. Having lots of different types of students and figuring out how do I solve this puzzle? You know, you do that a thousand times and you can, you're more likely to solve every puzzle that comes through the door, I guess. Um, what have I got on here? Your first aha moment as a singer. And when did you first start making progress? My first aha moment as a singer was when um, I had gotten in contact with this teacher online back in... I guess I first started talking with him back in... 2005 he was a classical teacher like early 2005 i want to say and he told me he i sent him a clip of me singing and he you know told me what he heard going on in my voice and he said he's of the two register theory he believes that there's chest voice and falsetto and you know you're just learning to coordinate the two and he said, your falsetto is too strong. He said, your falsetto is over pulling your chest. He said, your chest voice is weak. And everything else every, that everyone else had, that I had always heard up until that point, had always talked about, especially for guys, you know, most guys have a chest voice that's too strong and they need to learn to develop the head voice more. And he was the first person that explicitly said to me, 
your chest voice is weak. You need to get it stronger. And I was like, huh? Baydeen kind of said something similar to me, but not as explicitly. She, she would keep telling me that when I would do the exercises, she would say, you need more chest voice in them. You need more chest voice. But I didn't know how to, to, to sing into my chest voice. I didn't know how to... I didn't understand the how part, but she did say you need more chest voice. And she would say if Seth Riggs was working with you, she said he would have you keep chest longer in the scale. She said you're mixing way too early. You need to tick your chest voice up much higher and 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 go from there. And the other thing that she told me is because I would bring clips into her sometimes and say, well, how's this singer doing this? How's this singer doing that? And, and she'd say, oh, they're just taking chest voice up to the high C like an operatic tenor would. And then I was like, wait a minute. I thought that I thought that they were supposed to be doing this in their head voice. And she said, no, they just learn to pull chest all the way up to a high C, but you learn to do it in control. But that's basically what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So that was another aha moment for me because I was like, oh, wait, I mean, that's kind of what this other classical teacher was saying, too, is that that's basically the same thing they're doing is you learn to take your chest voice, but you learn to control it. You learn to you learn to um, coordinate it correctly, because up until that moment, I thought that chest voice was just this thing that you know where it went up to a certain note and then after that if you tried to go higher with it it just got more and more and more and more strained and i had to learn to divorce the idea of strain with chest voice chest voice is its own thing strain is something totally different because you can strain in your chest voice you can strain in your falsetto you can strain on a loud note you can strain on a soft note strain is just simply miscoordination period yeah. But that's not be to be confused with chest voice. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And um, the my experience of what you're talking about was, and I try and get this across to students often, is a lot of students make this choice where they will they will compress a little bit less as they go to the top part of their range, mm -hmm. and it starts to sound a little bit, you know, like headier or more more towards uh, a lighter type of coordination. And a lot of the time, I have to say to them like literally just pull chest mm -hmm. as long as you as long as you keep the vowel in control it's it's not going to hurt you and and it seems alien to them at first because they're like you know this is going against what i've been told i need to it needs to be lighter it needs to be headier it's like yeah but it's not really this is where the terms start to confuse people a lot um i certainly had a journey where all of a sudden i understood i can compress a lot and thin out yeah i've got to work a bit harder to thin out but it's not going to hurt me as long as I am making sure that I feel that release happening all the time, regardless of the compression level I'm on. That's how I explain it anyway. So that kind of does segue us a bit into this first main type of topic here, which is understanding compression. Um, I've got some, I don't know if you've got what I sent you here, but um, I don't know if you want to talk broadly about that or I can go through these four bullet points I've got and we can kind of cover them individually or what was your thoughts we can go through them one by one. Yeah. Well, uh, some of these did relate to the 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 questions actually that I've that we had up. So um, the first thing over here is are compression and squeeze the same thing? Um, I mean, oh. I guess we'd need to just define like compression and squeeze first in terms of what people generally mean by those two terms. Okay. So I would put it this way. Compression in its most simple form is mm, an intensifying of the sound. There is this sense of intensity of air pressure building up within you. And what goes along with that is the vocal cords closing more strongly. But it, it, it's so some of the elements of compression are when the compression gets greater, the intensity, the volume in the voice, the how loud you are, you just get louder. The sound gets more intense, you get louder, and the sound should get clearer, meaning there should not be a hint of airiness or breathiness in the sound if the compression is working correctly. Now, if you attempt to get louder and your voice starts to get air, so, so if I do something like a, like a, 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 that's with this compression. This, eh, eh, eh. Now, if it starts to get airy and I try to go louder, 
hey, hey. That's what a lot of people do, especially if they're, they've heard, oh, you need to relax. You just need to relax everything. So they relax everything, but they relax the compression too, and then try to go louder, and now you got issues because now you're functioning against, you're behaving in a way that is against how the voice wants to function. So um, that is a problem. Now, now the idea of squeeze, that, that's an interesting one because it depends on, on your development level. So if you're coming from the standpoint of, you know, you're a singer who's like this, especially if your speaking voice sounds like this too, you have kind of like this sound and then you're singing with the same sound. So you do something like... Uh, I don't know if I'm singing something like, Isn't she lovely? Isn't she wonderful? And you have kind of this kind of a sound to your voice, then that means that you're lacking compression. So when you first find compression correctly, number one, you're going to feel very intense in your body. It's going to feel like your body and your torso and your abdominal region and your lower abdominal region and your sides and your back. It's going to feel like that's actually working and working intensely. That's the intensity coming from the buildup of air pressure that you need. And at first, it could feel like your throat is squeezing relative to this uh, state. There's there's no sense of anything resisting the air. And then all of a sudden, you get to, uh, and it feels like, oh, it feels like my throat's in a little bit of a squeeze state. No, that's not where you want to be ideally, but at first, it will be like that. And, and you're, you don't want to run from that. And that's partly where you need to be with a teacher who understands this. Because when you're in that little bit of an over squeeze state, you don't want to go too high with it at first because the higher notes will exact, can exaggerate some of that squeeze quality even more. So you just kind of want to get used to putting out a clear sound. The idea is put out a clear sound that has some intensity behind it. Uh, ah! Uh, even if it's ah, uh, ah, uh, at first, it's over squeeze like that. that. That's better than going ah, uh, ah. Uh, it's better than doing that. So eventually, you'll get to the point where it's ah, uh, ah, uh, where it's just a clear sound, but it doesn't have that over squeeze in with it. And then you can keep moving forward and start to explore more of your higher notes and different volume dynamic levels and things of that nature. I don't know what would do you have. Do you view that differently or have anything that you would add to it? No, um, I th my sense is, I mean, agreeing with you, I, th I liked what you said about the idea that this I that squeeze is a relative term because if somebody is very, you know, uh, 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 they're already doing a lot of that, then for them, like, they need to let go more and vice versa for the example you gave. So, no, wait, wait, no, and, no, um, no, that's funny you should say that, let go, okay. So mm, this is this is the other part that I wanted to mention when I said yeah. I had a lot of, to say about this. So I work for the siren to pass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, welcome to East London. <laughs> I get people sometimes who are who are already in that squeeze state. So meaning that they already can put out a clear sound, but there may be some over squeeze in it due to miscoordination. And then they, they say, oh, my throat feels tight. My throat feels squeezed. Like, how do I get rid of this? I, I, I want to feel more relaxed. How do I do that? And so the common advice that they hear is, well, just don't sing so loudly. Just back off the voice some, back off. And I would say it's a little bit different than that. And that's where you have to come to understand vowels because vowels influence this very, 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 very strongly. So... Vowels like E, A, A, especially E and A, they will encourage a whole lot of this squeezing activity. Yeah. So that's why I use those vowels for people who, who have breathy voices, who have airy voices, who have voices that are underpowered. It's to get you from point A to point B. It's not getting you to the end goal. It's getting you just simply from one point to the next point. And that's an important part, point to make. Because a lot of people think, oh, I just do this ad and then I'll be exactly where I want to be. No, no, that's one step in the process. <laughs> so now, once you get that down and you're to the point where you have a strong voice, but it could be a little bit tense in the throat, a little bit over squeeze, that's when you have to start working on ooh and oh, a closed oh and a, and a very, 
you have to do your vowels like Italians. So you have to have these ooh, ooh, not the way we do it in English. So it can't be ooh, ooh, because that's going to encourage the squeeze to want to kick in more. It has to be ooh, and then it has to be oh. It can't be oh, like we say it in English. That's going to imbalance things more. It has to be oh, 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 like that. Yeah. Reason being because the the different vowels influence your the way the vocal cords will position themselves or how your squeeze or how the uh, compression will engage. So when you have the vowels like ooh and o, oh, by the very nature of producing them in that manner, it lessens compression. So I get people sometimes that are singing airy and then they're trying to do vowels on ooh and o, oh, and I said that's just going to make your problem worse. So you have to make sure that you apply the correct vowel at the right time. But it has to be done with this mindset of I need to be at this certain intensity level. I need to be at, you know, I need to keep going for a clear sound. But this oh and oh, they're automatically going to lessen the compression. Yeah, what, what I'm hearing there. So as far as I see it, that's how you quote unquote let go of the excessive squeeze. Yeah. Uh, I guess I would the the way that I would explain that, and I I, I feel like I'm basically in agreement. Um, I would just explain it in the sense of looking for a middle ground uh, because those that that the 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 e and the did you say the a ah, yeah, yeah e and a ah. these encourage a lot of squeeze and those those other ones you did are more there's like medium compression, at least in terms of my ears. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and you're absolutely right, but they're still closed. That's the thing, like like you say, it's still connected. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so, uh, and yeah, it's those people that over squeeze need to stay squeezed in a sense, but they need to learn to manage that squeeze some so that it's not like they're holding on for dear life. It's like, okay, you you can close and stay through there connected, but you don't necessarily have to be as aggressive with it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I, I, I haven't, I think, so I have, I wouldn't typically explain it with as specifically with vowels like you have, but I, I would approach it in the same way. Um, my mind is that whilst, Vowels encourage, so ah, 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 for example, encourages that heavier kind of closure. Um, you could explain it in different ways. If I back off the compression and I go to like a ah, 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 it's like it still kind of sounds like ah, but it is lighter than ah, ah, ah. So my sense is that vowels drag you in different directions and there is a kind of overlap between a lot of different sounds. Like a mum would be kind of something like in, in between in terms of sets medium compression, whereas a wee 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 would typically drag you towards headier compression or uh, lighter compression and things like that. And so I, I, I view in terms of this kind of broad overlap of vowels and, and picking a vowel that is... So, you know, like, a, for example, for me, so like a no, 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 like a no, for example, would be something that would be kind of connected and a, a kind of a medium light type of sound. Um, whereas, yeah, like a na, 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 this type of sound obviously is going to close the chords down a lot more and it's harder to back off that type of sound. Um, yeah. So, but I think with me is like, I um, I explain and understand this just really based on my own experience more so. So um, it's it's less kind of anchored down in a lot of, you know, in a lot of wide reading and things like that. So I don't know if it is always in, in line with, with you know, the, the, the kind of orthodoxy, I guess you'd say, of how other people explain it and things. But um, yeah, sorry, were you going to say something? Yeah, I wanted to add to what you were saying that so when I mention about vowels, that that's where it gets into a very, very um, big topic, because the understanding of how the vowels all every single vowel when done in its, I guess, quote unquote, um, pure state, uh, ideal state where it, each one will exhibit different characteristics and influence the voice, influence your vocal cords, influence your whole mechanism to behave in a particular way. But 
the real work in voice training is number one, learning to get position all the vowels correctly as they should be. So for instance, if I get people an ah, for instance, is supposed to bring out volume in the voice. It's supposed to encourage the chest voice to come out a lot. It's, but if I have someone singing an ah and they're not getting loud with it, that automatically tells me their voice is imbalanced. That's how my voice was. I would try to sing ah and it wasn't coming out louder. That yeah. means your chest voice is imbalanced. On the mm -hmm. same hand, when you sing out, when you sing an ooh, it's supposed to bring out this mellowness in the voice, this these deeper, darker overtones. If you sing an ooh and and it sounds more like ooh, then that means that you have an imbalance of a different type. That means that you need to work more on your on your falsetto. You need to work more on keeping the depth in the sound. It, it, it so every vowel, understanding that every vowel has a different purpose, and then. The next layer of work comes in learning to mix the qualities of the vowels. That's to me, that's what quote unquote mixing was. When I was working with Bay Dean and we talked about mixing, uh, in most cases it was about the vowels, mixing the vowels together. So she would say your throat will position itself for one vowel, but your mouth is positioning itself for a different vowel. And that's how you get the quote unquote split in resonances or the changes in resonance. Yeah, and I, I so love that what gets you said in, that. Yep. And that gets into what you were saying about the ass. So, for instance, I tell people there's there's a spectrum for all the vowels that you sing. So, for instance, if I look at a ah in its most quote unquote pure form, it would be like a ah, ah, like the sound of a baby crying. Ah, 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 like, you know, that 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 kind of a sound. So if I do something like that, how about here? No. It's a very eh, like kind of piercing kind of sound. That's at in its most pure form. If you do it that way, it, it it creates certain conditions in your vocal tract that encourages your chords to stay together. It encourages it encourages a louder volume. It encourages a thinner sound, which in some cases is desired, in some cases not good. It depends on where you're at. But as you begin to balance that, you have to invite more of the mellow qualities of ooh and o oh into it. So if I do o oh in its most, a closed o, oh, you have a closed o and an open o. Oh. Open o is more like ah, oh, ah, oh, and the closed o is more like a o, oh, o. Oh. So closed o is when you, where you do all this work from. You do something like a o. Oh. That creates a totally different configuration and, 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 and setup of everything. So you have to learn to merge the two qualities together you want some of the strength and some of the brassiness of the ah but you also want the mellowness and the relaxation in the throat of the o so if you're trying to sing an ah but with some of the old qualities it changes the way the ah sounds so it's no longer ah it becomes now ah uh, it becomes that instead of ah ah uh, yeah uh, now it's taking on some of the somewhat dark qualities of the O. Oh, now it's coordinating in a totally different way. Now when you're, when you're at that place, now you can start going higher. Now you can start working on the other aspects of the voice. That will, be, will become easier to control in terms of your dynamics. You can do a lot more with that. And, and that's what like 90% of voice <laughs> technique work is. Understanding your vowels, understanding how to use them, when to use them, when it's appropriate how to mix them together to get different qualities in the voice. And you actually talked about this in your video on Brendan Yuri because um, he's, what's really interesting about how he has balanced his voice is he has it correct in terms of basically everything from a G above middle C on down in his voice, he's found this deeper quality correctly. He's found this proper coordination of this ooh and o oh in his voice and learn to shade that into all of his vowels. That's why he sounds like Frank Sinatra when he's basically from G4 on down. Yeah, he's got that kind of uh, a little bit of a dopey quality up the, on the bottom of his chest. And I think in that video I kind of said but uh, in the higher stuff he kind of doesn't do that so much. It's um, mm -hmm. an interesting contrast. Because um, you can't. You can't do it higher. Yeah, well, it would sound probably too operatic for contemporary music if 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 he did, you know, if, if it was, if the vowels would like da overly darken like that. I'm trying to I'm trying to imagine it in my mind at least. Anyway, um, what I loved about what you just said was uh, was the demonstrations you gave. 
that the uh, the R you did was right in between the two sounds and it sounded quote unquote balanced. It sounded like, you know, just pretty much where you're talking, balanced compression, closed, not overly bright, not overly dark, which is, uh, you know, what most styles are going to call for. Um, uh, very, very good ex explanation. Um, uh, what I've got, I've, in terms of other things I've got on here, you've, we've kind of covered some. I've got um, how, we've kind of covered how does it, we're covering this actually. How does a singer learn to compress or learn to find this, you know, this air type quality or something that if if they are airy, for example, I have students who you can, you know, you can say to them, you know, make this sound. Na 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 na, and they'll go na 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 na, and you can spend quite a while just trying to get them to you know to say ah 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 to try and just make some bright sounds. They've just probably never done it before in their life, depending on their character or you know. Mm -hmm. Other people will get it within two minutes, you know, like like it's nothing for them at all, um, and uh, those harder cases. Um, how do you deal with those out of interest? Well, I would say a lot of it just depends. And as you said, it, it does depend on the personality of the person. That was something that Baydeen emphasized to me over and over and over again. And she said, everyone is different. And I would watch and I would ask, well, why did you do this thing with this one singer, but then not do it with the other one? And she said, because everyone is different. They have a different personality, a different temperament, a different psychological state in terms of what they can handle and what they can't handle. So for instance, she said, would we'll say, you know, some people just can't take criticism. You know, if you, if you point out just even one thing wrong that they do, they just shut down and then they can't hear anything else that you say after that. So from that standpoint, it, it literally just depends because a lot of times people who are, are lacking compression tend to be sensitive they tend to be on a bit on the shy side they tend to be um fearful fear fear is actually the biggest issue in, in in voice fear fear in whatever form it it presents itself whether it's fear of making a mistake whether it's fear of being too loud whether it's fear that someone might hear you whether it's fear that someone might judge you and say you don't sound good when you're singing whether it's fear of actually feeling your body working and fear of actually feel like you're putting some energy and some effort into the sound production, whether it's fear in any form, it doesn't matter. Your, your body has a response to fear, a physiological response to fear that prevents your voice from coordinating the way you need it to. So a lot of what I do is finding a way, any way, any type of creative way of sidestepping a person's fear. So in some cases that may mean I can use something creative like just simply we just start playing a game like I just start talking a lot of times when I start off lessons I just talk with a person for a few minutes but they don't realize I'm, I'm listening I'm listening for a lot of things I'm listening to see what is your emotional state at the moment what sounds you can make freely in your speaking voice and and normally I, I pick up on a few sounds that I hear them say freely where the compression actually kicks in and I say, remember earlier when you said, you know, I, I, I don't know, I, 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 and I said, can you do that for me again? And then all of a sudden they're in it. So it, it really just depends. Now, now, the other part of this is sometimes people are not aware of the sensations that will accompany this. And sometimes the sensations, the physical, visceral sensations scare them. So just simply letting a person know, hey, you might feel this in your throat. It might feel like your throat is getting ready to squeeze. But as long as it's not causing you pain, then it's okay. We'll just just hold on temporarily. It's not going to be like that forever. As long as it's not causing you pain, but it might feel a little bit squeezed, okay. Oh, your abs. Your abs might feel like they're compressing. You might feel like this sense of air pressure bottling up within you and 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 and, and like like a um like a pressure cooker and it's like getting the pressure is building more and more like it's trying to shoot the lid off but the lid is staying down on it you might feel like that and, and it's all these sensations especially people who are coming from the standpoint of relax 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 when they feel that sense of air pressure <laughs> building up in their torso it scares them because they're like what is this i'm doing too much i must be doing something wrong and i say no that that's exactly what it should feel like and i also let them know that at first you're going to have to put a lot more energy into this 
to find the right sound compared to where you will be, let's say two months from now, then it'll take less energy to do the exact same thing because they're like, I, I, this is the one I hear so commonly is, oh my God, I'm expending so much energy into this. It's like, and I'm like, yeah, you will. And when I first started to find my chest voice, it felt like I had to give like from the heavens in terms of energy output, the sound felt fine in my throat, but it's like, oh my God, it's like, this is tiring. Like it's, it's not uncommon when I'm in lessons with people that they break out into a sweat. Like a lot of times, especially when I'm working with guys, they actually have to go change their shirts because they start sweating so much. I'm like, that's mm. normal. That, that That's normal. When you start actually singing into your voice and using your body, you will sweat. You, you will sweat. And well, especially so, if you're a little bit nervous, even a little bit, you'll sweat a lot as well. I used to come out drenched after some lessons I had years ago just because I was so stressed it both emotionally and just you know mm -hmm. it's it can be a, a combination of that carry on so yeah it's just letting people know a lot of those sensations another thing i do with people is people don't realize that air air in terms of volume of air is something that actually affects compression that was the other thing i wanted to 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 mention so the more air you take in in terms of volume of air the more it causes the car, the vocal cords to want to open up. It makes them harder to compress. So the mistake I see a lot of people make is they think, oh, I need to make a louder sound. I need to make a stronger sound with strong compression. So they go and they start tanking up on more and more and more air. And I'm like, you just, you're just making it harder for yourself to, to, to compress your cords. Because once you're in that state that the cords, they don't want to close firmly like this. It's hard for them. That's when your neck muscles will start to kick in and a bunch of other stuff and it just miscoordinates the whole thing. So I have people blow out their air and then try to make sound with very little air in their lungs. I tell them, take in only 10% of your max lung capacity, then sing. When you take in less air like that, it aids the cords in sucking together and, and compressing harder. So, and then that also gets them this physical, visceral feeling of the abs compressing the air and they're like, what is this? They're like, I really have to work hard, what is this? And I'm like, yeah, that's the compression. Get used to it. And um, so there's that factor. And then the, what I mentioned earlier about O and the closed O, because they tend to lessen compression, in order to do those with the same volume level as something like an A ah or an A, ah, you actually have to compress harder in the sense that it feels like you have to give a greater intensity just to get to the same volume. And that's something that throws people off when they first start training their bridges, their passaggio, especially for the guys like the E, F, F sharp area for females, the B like above tenor or the B above uh, middle C. So B4, C5, C sharp five area. You have to compress the chords harder to compensate for the fact that those vowels tend to want to loosen the chords. So it's like you have to give a much greater intensity level, and that's what throws people off too. They're like, wait a minute, what, wait, what? Because they try to give the same levels before, and I'm like, that's not going to work here. It's going to make you disconnect. Mm. I like that because I've experienced with my own singing is if you transition between vowels, sometimes... In a sense, you're on the same compression level, as in the quality of the sound stays the same. Mm -hmm. But during that transition, it certainly doesn't necessarily feel like you're holding on the same amount. It, it exactly. can feel like you're holding on more to get the same quality. Mm -hmm. um, and that can certainly throw singers a lot through me for many years, this type of thing. Because, um, because when you talk about keeping something the same, people intuitively assume, well, I need to that means it needs exactly the same amount of effort, which isn't necessarily the case. Uh -uh. You can It can be the case that just to keep something the same, you have to actually change the amount of effort to keep it yes. the same. Yes. Um, this is the kind of distinction that, that I'm thinking of when you t you're talking anyway. Um, and that's why people struggle to sing an ooh. Like I, I, I make everyone learn to sing an ooh, a proper Italian ooh, because that is necessary for coordination in your first bridge range. If you do not learn to sing an oo, you will never learn to coordinate your first bridge properly. It, it has to be done in a very, very, very particular way. And when you learn to sing loudly on an oo, that's when you really have to learn to build up this inner intensity, this inner air pressure a lot, because that one just wants to make the chords just go, who, and they just want to open up so easy, especially if, so for instance, I'll show you. Um, 
So you have several different ways that people do ooh. You have this, so I'm here, this will be on an F above middle C, so this will be right in the middle of your bridge range. So you have people that do it ooh like ooh, ooh, ooh. You have that kind of a ooh. That comes from the chords being over squeezed. So uh, when, when you st if you're lacking compression and then you finally start to work on your compression, normally a lot of people will run into a wall right around the F or so, especially on closed vowels like O and E. They'll feel like it just gets overly squeezed. Like mm -hmm. if I go, Ooh, and they're just like, Ooh, it's just like, it's like I can get some strength behind the voice, but it's like Ooh, here. So then at first they'll try to just simply back off the volume. Ooh, and I'm like, that's not the real solution because you need to be able to be dynamic with the voice. You need to be able to go loud and soft, not just only be able to go softer in order to manage the tension. That's just a band-aid being applied to being applied to what's going on. Then, so I tell them your ooh, it should be dark. Ooh is a dark vowel. It, 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 that's the inherent nature of ooh when it's done correctly. So at first, when they find the right darkness in the ooh, it ends up just going to falsetto or something close to it. They'll go ooh. That's setting up your throat in the right position, but it doesn't have that compression in there with it. That's actually something between falsetto and 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 chest voice. What I just did there, but but it's like if I go. That's the inherent quality of the ooh. It's supposed to have that dark, hooty kind of sound. Now, when you do it and you get the chest voice in there correctly, ooh, ooh, it'll get a little bit of brightness relative to this ooh, relative to that sound. So then it goes ooh, and then you can get some play and volume there, but it keeps more of the comfort in the throat. So if I go... Oh, oh, then I can go louder with I can lean into it, I can back off of it a little bit. Oh, then you can push on it and go, oh, and you can put that same intensity behind it, but you have to compress that harder than doing something like ah, oh, that, that doesn't require anywhere near the same compression as oh, like you really have to dig into your body. Hard to do an ooh like that. And the same thing for E, but especially ooh, because ooh makes the chords want to go ooh. It makes them want to open up like that when you do a, a proper full depth ooh. And that's what's interesting to me about Brendan Urie is he got that down. He got that <laughs> down. Some, somehow or another, I guess by listening to Frank Sinatra, he got that down, at least up through the G above middle C. Yeah. I mean, uh, the I've, I found that the ooh and the E on the the fuller compressions are probably the hardest some of the hardest to master in the uh mm -hmm. like up through the bridge and above that uh they definitely i was struggling with those even like six months to a year ago i didn't have them as nailed as i do now um but the, uh, my sense as well is just that um i have to to keep those vowels balanced and it, it, when they're compressed i have to, i have to work harder than i do on other on other types of sounds to keep them in the same position released. Um, and that's kind of going back to what I was saying a few minutes ago about this idea of, of disproportionate, disproportionate amounts of effort to, to get the same result, depending on the type of sound. Um, mm -hmm. um, let's well, go can I, can, can I yeah, just yeah, say yeah. one thing? Because I need to throw this out there. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I know a lot of people have been looking at my video on how to take the chest voice higher. Hmm. And I know a lot of people get caught up on this bright ah that I was doing in the video and nobody is practicing the ooh. People don't realize that the ooh is just as important, if not more important than the ah. The ah, the reason why it's bright like that and done at a lot of intensity is to develop the right compression that you need. But then the ooh has to be done in that specific darker way to balance it out because if you don't do that your voice will become imbalanced it's not a well maybe it's going to become imbalanced and it will become imbalanced very quickly you must yeah. do both well you have to uh this is a very good point and something that i advocate for a lot because you actually get uh, you get a lot of people that can sing pretty pretty high on those wide wide open sounds 
But if you get them on like on a on those darker, narrower sounds on heavy compression, like they they can't do it. They will always go wider. They'll the vowel will just warp. And every time as you train them to not let it slip out and and it's yeah, it's it's tough to do because in my mind at least it, it feels like you you've got two opposing things kind of pulling against each other when you when you're on those very dark narrow vowels on heavy compression. It feels counterintuitive at first and everything in your mind wants it, I remember feeling like everything was telling me let go, let go, let go. And actually mm-hmm. I've found as I've got better at them it's been the opposite for me. It's actually hold on, hold on, hold on, but in the right way and that's that's mm-hmm. the key distinction because it's very easy to hold on the wrong way as we know um yeah let's um let's go to this though I've, I've put this like finding common ground between coaches and you uh, from reading your kind of bio on your website i got a sense that m- much more than me you've kind of done the round so to speak with various different techniques and certainly gone into them in more more depth than i have and uh, I wanted to just ask you really about, uh, I put here about any common threads that might hold them together or do you feel like they're very, you know, separate in certain ways? And also, um, yeah, do you, do you think there's, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think there's things that can be reconciled that can't be reconciled? Do you have, a, do you have preferences in terms of which, which of these techniques is better or worse or this type of thing? Or do you just take what you want from each one and kind of leave it at that? Going back to what I said earlier about what Dean told me, which is that everyone is different. And she said something very interesting to me. She said when she was first studying and learning, she told me that you know, she had 19 other teachers, or maybe I think it was like 21, because she started counting more. And then later on, she told me, I think it was even more. But she had 19 teachers all over the world before she met Seth Riggs. And she told me that what Seth gave for her was balance in the sense that her personality type is one to where she's just over the top and wants to overdo everything. And she said, for her, Seth Riggs helped to rein her in. So that's one thing she kept emphasizing to me is that when it comes to choosing a teacher, she said, it's not just enough to consider whether they um, have a technical understanding of the voice. You also need to consider where their personality is at and whether how it will mesh with yours and also what your goals are. That, that, that you're trying to achieve. Because she said if she had been working like she did in the past with a teacher who has a fiery temperament like her, that would just further imbalance her voice even if, even if they do know what they're doing because it's just like a mismatch. Because she said what she would do is she had two different teachers she was working with. She was working with Seth at the same time that she was working with a t- another teacher in New York City. And she said that you know she needed both at the same time because she said if she stayed only with Seth, then it would have been like reining her in too much. But then she said when she got to Bill in New York, she she was just like, he just lets her sing out the way she wants to. And she said she needed that. She needed someone that just lets her sing out and sing loud and just be however that she wanted to be. And she needed that to find balance. And so that gets me into my point with all these different methods is that I don't think it's necessarily the method itself, but rather where you are at any given point in time and how that method fits in with 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 what you need, not what, what you're trying to achieve, but what you need at that time because it can be balancing or it can be imbalancing. So a lot of it also comes down to the teacher that you're learning it from. You know, what is their temperament and personality because you know I've seen some SLS teachers that I've worked with that have a very you know kind of shy kind of temperament and and that influences how they teach even if they're teaching the exact same ideas it influences how they teach it and how they get across you know what they're trying to get you to do with their voice and then you have other teachers who are very extroverted and even if they're teaching the same material it's going to come across differently so I think a lot of it comes down to um how it fits with you. Then the other part of that is the general trend that I've come across is that um, a lot of the methods out there have one or a few pieces of the puzzle. And that's the same thing that Baydeen told me. She said after she worked with Seth Riggs, she said that 
she then understood what each of the other 19 teachers was trying to get across to her. She understood why they were saying this, why they were saying that, oh, they had that one piece of the puzzle, and then you had this one over here, they had another piece. And it's like, very, very rarely do you come across a method that shows you how all of the sounds fit together in relation to one another. And that's getting into a lot of what I was saying about the vowels earlier. You have to really... If you're with someone who really understands on a very deep level how every single vowel functions in relation to one another, how the vowels influence your dynamics level, how they influence your the pitch that you're singing at, how they influence um, the way your voice gets colored, how they influence the tensions that you feel in your throat, how they influence your breathing, how they influence your sense of intonation. And yes, the way you sing your vowel will influence your intonation, how it influences um, the way you handle certain melodic lines, how it influences the way you have to position your body in terms of how you position your head, how you position your, you know, your posture and all that stuff. If you, uh, most methods don't really have that full understanding of how all those parts relate to each other. So, in that sense, in a lot of cases with mes with methods, you'll you'll get like a skewing. So, for instance. I tell people that if you're studying SLS, the people that that method is best suited for are for people who already have strong voices but are just having problems with tension and or problems with high notes, problems with controlling the, the softer dynamics of the voice. Those are the people for whom SLS is best suited. If you are of the shy type or a person who has an underpowered voice or anything of that nature, SLS is not best suited for you. You might find a teacher here or there that might understand how to fix it, but generally speaking, that, that that's not the case. So, like, for those types of people, I would say, now, I don't know a whole lot about Ken Tamplin's method, but I would say for those shy types, Ken's method can help you more in building some necessary strength that you need in the voice, and then from there maybe then you can look into something like SLS's material to kind of round out some of the edges a little bit more of what you need. When it comes to CBT, that's an interesting one because I do feel like they give you more of an overview of how a lot of the sounds relate to each other. But um, my experience has been, and this is from you know having students who have trained in the method and actually going to Denmark to, to study at the Institute and things of that nature, is that that method is best suited for advanced singers. Singers who basically have control of most of their voice and maybe it's just one thing that, that that's just kind of evading them. So maybe it's just one particular note in your range that you're not able to do or just a certain volume level on just a certain vowel that you're just not able to find. People like that, CBT will work well for because I find that it doesn't work as well for beginners who have like no foundation under their voice and just have no clue what they're doing and no clue what's going on. It's like, <laughs> it, it's like they, they are more spe problem specific oriented rather than giving someone, okay, this is, okay, we're gonna give you a foundation. I find it's not as useful for that. Let's see. What are some of the other methods out there? Uh, I think in terms of the, there's the broad ones is going to be, you know, SLS and SS, which are kind of one and the same in a lot of ways. Um, and then, I mean, I don't know if you, I, I liked what you said about Ken Tamplin, because I do think that's true. I think for a particularly shy students, he's probably a good, good pick because he is going to drag them towards him because I think what happens is with people is you you kind of as a coach you end up you end up in this mental battle almost and it's a question of who's going to be stronger in terms of are you going to drag them towards you or uh, or, or are they going to drag you towards them so you you might have felt this in lessons but you often feel students that panic a lot it's easy to get sucked into it. Surprisingly mm. easy to get sucked back into feeling what they're feeling. It like humans innately, uh, the emotions that the what's going on in their mind is so infectious. And as a coach, a lot of the time, my job is to in emotionally be be the leader, so to speak. Mm -hmm, and if, exactly. if you're a very confident person like Ken, 
and you're leading somebody who's shy towards you, that is certainly going to help. Um, and so all that stuff I'm, I've, I feel like is, is, is deep and not stuff that you typically hear on, you know, singing tips videos, but absolutely relevant. Um, I'm not ness I'm not really too clued up on CVT other than a, a few bits in terms of terminology and stuff. Um, and this is why I was kind of asking you just generally about some of these things. Um, but it's funny. I, the other thing I was thinking of as well, just to briefly finish on that is that when you spoke about people typically if people, somebody has an aha moment with one method or another then they'll be like oh that was the silver bullet you know that's oh. that was the one that was the best method and i found a lot of the time i i've had memories of things that i went through with other coaches years and years ago where i, th I thought back and i remembered like you said ah that's what they were talking about but I wasn't at a level where I could understand it then. I wasn't exactly. quite there. And then exactly. years later, you look back and you're like, oh, okay, I understand now what they were saying. But at the time, I didn't. And so, you, and back then, I may have said, oh, they're not very good at their job or they don't know what they're talking right. about. But now I would have said, I know it was actually the opposite. It was me that didn't know what, what, who, what he was doing and didn't know what he was thinking or talking about. Well, you <laughs> like know, it's, I had... it's the opposite a lot of the time. And that's, that's the thing is people... People always assume they're people are either they're either smarter than you and they know they are, or they are less intelligent than you, but they think that they know more. Did you know what I mean? It's like a lot of the time it's hard to distinguish between does this person actually know more than me or do they just think they know and all this stuff and yeah, that's a completely different very big topic really. But sorry, what were you gonna say? I was just going to say that I had that experience myself. There's one instance that I could specifically think of. So when I started training with Baydeen, um, it was odd because I started, I started out by taking a phone lesson with her in January of 2004. And I figured, okay, I'm just going to, you know, I just wanted some feedback because I had been working with the uh, Singing for the Stars, you know, Seth Riggs book prior to that for a good mm, five, six months. And I felt like I wasn't getting that far, but I felt like I just needed, I was like, I can't do this on my own. I need, I need, I need somebody else to guide me through this. And since she was the closest teacher to me, but she lived too far, I had called her up one day and we spoke for a few minutes and she mentioned that she did phone lessons. So I said, okay, I'll try a phone lesson with her. So I did that and then I realized, okay, I need more. So then that's when I actually found the means to be able to take, you know, some face to face lessons with her. And so I had my first lesson with her in August of 2004. And it was actually to prepare me for an audition to continue taking more lessons at the university, because the, the university that I was going to relative to where she lived, that would have been a four and a half hour drive. So there's no way I would have been able to get to her weekly regularly for lessons. So. Um, we just did a lot of preparation for auditions for the lessons with the university. So my first teacher that I had at the university, she was a grad student. And I remember her telling me in the first lesson, she said, she said, you're my first male student that I've ever worked with. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this will be interesting. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so after seven weeks of lessons with her, I realized that I had made much more progress in one lesson with Baydeen than I did in seven weeks of continuous lessons with her. And I'm like, okay, um, yeah, it's time to move on. So Baydeen um, knew of someone else, a musical theater teacher who taught at my university, and she said, oh, try, try to get in with lessons with Mary if you can. And I wasn't able to get in with her. I think, I forget why. I think either she was full that yeah, she might have been full that semester and couldn't take anyone else. So she recommended me to another teacher who was off campus. And um, and I started training with him. And he was trying to get me to sing with more volume. So in some sense, he did identify the fact that my chest voice was weak. He never described it in those terms. But what he was trying to get me to do was basically addressing the issue. So one of the things that he would keep having me do is he would have me go to the window and he would say, you see that building across the street, which was a school. 
he would say, pretend like there is a child that you see out there coming out of the school and is getting ready to cross the street, and you see that they're getting ready to get hit by a car, and you're like, hey, watch out! He's like, like pretend like you're going to yell like that to them. And so I would try to do it, and I would get hoarse every single time I was there. I would go, hey! Because, I'm once again, I'm yelling with this excess air in the voice. Yelling itself is not bad. It's how you yell that makes a difference. So I'm like... Hey, ha, and, I, and I'm like this and pushing out this excess of air because I didn't know how to yell. Most people don't know this. I was born with vocal damage. I was born with a partially paralyzed vocal cord due to birth trauma. I got strangled by my umbilical cord when I was born and I left some residual nerve damage as a result of that. So that's the reason why I've had a lot more issues with closure than the normal person would, because it's like I'm dealing with that on top of just simply having to learn how to just simply coordinate the voice. So I would do this, and and then and now looking back, I understand what he was trying to get me to do, but he didn't address that fact that I'm making this with this airy sound that I need that I need some way somehow to get a clear sound coming out of me. So at that in 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 that sense. He wasn't the best person. And I remember I went home during spring break right after one of those lessons. And I told Baydeen because I had a lesson with her then. And she was like, yeah, I've had teachers that do the same with that did the same with me, too. They would tell me to yell across the street or, or something like that. She's like, and you just feel your larynx going up and choking you and killing you half to death. <laughs> so she said to me, she said, when you have a teacher that tells you that you have to learn how to interpret what it is that they're telling you and put it in a framework that you can make it work. So he, she said, whenever he wants you to yell across the street, she said, you need to think of crying down in your larynx. You give this little, oh, oh, you need to give that little, oh, and your voice like that as you're yelling. And then it kind of protects your throat and protects your larynx. And then you can do what he's trying to get you to do, but you don't feel like you're going to die at the same time. Yeah. Well, that, that cry is, uh, I mentioned that in a video I did recently, but that that's the release mechanism working, as in that's the thing that's going to inhibit the yell and make it into a, a yell, but a healthy yell. Um, mm -hmm. And I like what you're saying, that it's not wrong to yell, it's it's a question of how you're yelling. Because really, like, singing in, singing full out uh, is, is just yelling in a way that's not going to hurt you. Mm -hmm. Li literally, that's all it is. And, um, and people don't, you know... People don't realize it's literally that simple. Uh, you know, obviously there's order to music, but it is when you when you're singing very loud, it's just yelling in a way that's not not ever going to hurt you. And it feels like, you know, it's you're in control of it. Like you can you can go to darker vowels or brighter vowels or whatever vowels required. You're not it's not just Aah! you know it's a, it's a right, right. It, there's a control to it. But it's it's probably you know it's, it's it can be very it can be very loud. Mm -hmm. um Very and it's well. not uh it's not it's not something that like what you were saying earlier you know people are told to relax and let go and release and release and mm, yeah kind of it depends <laughs> depends what you're letting go of it could be the wrong thing or the right thing that's the thing exactly um yeah um let's just uh, just move on to this last last thing i wanted to cover because uh, this was actually you goes back to earlier when I was saying about uh, your kind of broad knowledge and things. And I was interested in what you think about this, in terms of what what do you feel like is the best type of knowledge for a student or somebody when they sing and talk about some of the values of both. I, I'm thinking really in terms of um, you know things like reading reading a lot of text versus you know actually you know pr practical work. Um, there's going to be there's going to be benefits to both, but I put it here as first hand knowledge versus I guess you could say second hand knowledge or knowledge that is you know interpreted somebody's telling you it or you're reading it versus actually experimenting yourself you know with different sounds as we do with you know when we're working on whatever it is with us coach and stuff a lot of the time. Um, most of my the way I explain things is is just come from the first hand stuff I've done it's like mm -hmm. I tried this thousands of times it doesn't work this way if I do it this way it will work every time mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. I just try and explain it to people mm -hmm. um, whereas I think some other people have got more you know they have more terminology they probably draw more from 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 other 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 sources I guess you'd say um, 
Uh, I'll let I'll let you talk a bit on that if you've if you've got something. If if not, then I w- I can help you along. But um, you've done well so far. So, well, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a lot to say on that too. One second. Go away. What is this song? Stop it. Okay. Sorry, spam call. I've been getting these annoying spam calls from phone numbers that look almost like mine, except the last couple of digits will be changed and. Um, stop it. <laughs> Don't worry. It won't I... stop ringing. <laughs> okay. I, I, anyway. I, can clip, I can clip stuff very easily, so it's not a problem. No problem. So, um, yeah. Uh, let me just turn that off so it doesn't ring it. Oops. Don't want it that way. There we go. So, um, yeah. Okay, so for learners. Okay, so I will tell you what I have what I tell people when they're asking me questions about technique and things like that. Learning to sing, learning to, teaching yourself to sing is something that is very hard to do on your own, at least in terms of technique. Because um, in order to effectively learn vocal technique, you have to consider your personality, you have to consider your temperament, You have to consider your emotional state. You have to look at the influence that other things that you're doing in your life are having on your voice, whether for good or bad. Um, And that includes things like diet, how you sleep, um, how you exercise. I mean, like doing physical exercise, things of that nature. And your biases that you have towards certain types of sounds and other types of sounds, your preferences in terms of what you want to do stylistically. There's a lot going on there and most of it you will be unaware of and it will cause you to look at information with a skewed perspective and as a result of that you can't listen and assess yourself realistically and and accurately and for that reason most people will have a hard time teaching themselves like i'll just simply tell most people if you're trying to learn technique find someone Number one, that understands how all the sounds work with each other. And then number two, that you can connect with and that you feel comfortable working with. That, that's very important. Like, it's not good enough that they know what they're talking about. You, 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 they have to know, um, you have to feel comfortable working with them. Because if you feel uncomfortable, then once again, that goes back to that whole fear issue. Your voice will not work correctly if you're in a state of fear. So, um, so normally what I tell those people is, Stop reading stuff online. Stop looking up videos online. Stop doing all that stuff because it's more than likely what you're going to do is you're going to take that information and misapply it to your voice. You will apply it incorrectly and then just cause yourself more problems than where you already are. And then when you finally do end up training with a teacher two, three, five years from now and after trying to hodgepodge a piece of information from that teacher, a piece from this teacher, a piece from that teacher, a piece from this other teacher over here, you've just created an even more tangled web for yourself that now this teacher has to undo. You'd be better off not trying to do anything technical to your voice. I tell them instead what you should do or what you can do is work on your musicianship, work on your phrasing, work on your sense of timing, work on your ear, work on trying to convey a message to your audience. Do it within the mean, do it within your means. So if you only have a one octave range that you can sing in comfortably right now, fine, I don't care but learn how to work within that, but develop these abilities within that because, oh God, I get people coming to me and they do scales all the time and, they, and, and then they'll go something like, ah, and I'm, and I'm like, yeah, you're singing all the pitches, but <laughs> that's not music. <laughs> I'm like, you have so many other things that you can work on that you need to work on other than technique. How to actually make that sound like music. What Bedin used to always tell me is that even if you're singing a scale, it should still have musicianship behind it. It should still have musicality behind it. It should still sound like music. I tell my students that when you're singing, once you get some of the technical fundamentals down and get some basic control over your voice, when you, even if you're singing a scale, it should sound good enough to a person, to where a person can enjoy listening to it, to where you make someone want to pay just to hear you sing a scale. <laughs> if, it do, if it doesn't sound like that, 
So that means you need some more work on your musicianship, on your phrasing, on your musicality. Uh, that's how you approach a phrase. So I tell them that's the type of stuff that you need to be working on. That you can work on by yourself. It still will happen faster if you work with a teacher who understands it. But those are the types of things you can work on. Like, oh, what colors can I produce with my voice? I can do it that way. I can go, ah, ah, Learn to do what you can within your means until you can find a teacher to work with. That's what I would suggest. Do lots and lots and lots of listening. Your ear is more important than your intellect when it comes to the voice, because that is the area that most people are weakest in is their ear in terms of not just not so much in terms of pitch and things like that, but in terms of listening for the different colors and vowel sounds, because I'll do something. I'll sing an O like this. I'll go, oh, and I tell someone, OK, now you sing it back for me. And they'll go, oh, and I'm like, that's not what I did. And some people don't even hear the difference between the two. I'm yeah, like, those um... are two different sounds. And until you learn to hear the difference, it's going to take you a while before you improve. So in a lot of cases, the improvements in technique are not coming from you knowing what you're doing. It's simply learning to hear the difference between the two sounds. So you know go for this sound instead of that one. It's not It's not good enough to know intellectually that two different sounds exist. You can know that intellectually and still not hear it. Until you learn to hear it, then, you're not, then, then you've not made any progress. So I tell people learning to listen, sitting and listening to your artist and listening, how are they actually singing the vowel here? What, what kind of an ah are they using on this note? What kind of an o oh are they using on this note? Does it sound more like oh? Does it sound more like all? Oh? Does it sound more like oh? How does it actually sound? And it's not always, even though you understand it to be a certain word, it doesn't necessarily have to be that actual vowel that you will quote unquote normally say in speech. It could be something totally different that you weren't expecting, but until you sit and actually listen and pay attention closely, listen with headphones on at first when you do this, it will help you to tune in better to the sound. But you have to sit and listen and, and, and really listen to the sound and then try to emulate it. So you hear a sound and then you try to emulate the color of it, the, the way it sounds as best you can. And more than likely, you won't do it correctly at first. So then you listen again and then try to emulate it again. And then you listen again and try to emulate it again. This is what all natural singers do. Every single natural singer that I've grown up around that's never had a lesson a day in their life and learned to sing well, that's what they did. They just did that over and over. Nobody told them to do it. It's just they were so... They were so determined to learn how to sing like whatever singer that they were listening to that I would sit and watch them. They just sit with a one recording on repeat. They play a few lines, put it on pause, and then try to sing it. And they go, no, it doesn't sound like them. Then they listen again and try it again. They go, uh, it still wasn't right. And, they, and they, you just do that over and over. That, that's literally all it is. You're right. And and I, what, you say, what you're saying about the hearing, one thing that, Good, good, skilled singers. If 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 you give them a sound, they will give you a much generally a much more accurate copy back. Exactly. And they can just hear the very the very subtle differences in the types of in types of one. You know, you can have you can have a vowel. You can have various fractions of a vowel, and you can have a spectrum between one vowel and another. And mm -hmm. skilled singers will be able to pick up on exactly where that particular shape sits. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, it, uh, it it may not be just E. It may be a little bit towards something else. Exactly. And, it, and, it, uh, and they will just have this intuitive sense of exactly what, how to make that particular sound. And and people that are struggling don't. And I certainly didn't when I started. I remember having uh, lessons with people and, you know, they, they'd take me up and then they'd say, no, you're saying, you know, you're saying, you, you're not saying the same vowel through this exercise. And I'd be like, I'm sure I am. And then they'd mm -hmm. show me and I'd start thinking about it as I was doing something like, yeah, actually, it's not. It's different. I didn't notice that. But it would take me like quite a lot of time to start learning to distinguish. And obviously, each level you get to, you start to hear more and more detail. But it's mm -hmm. also the sense of detail in in the the depth to the sound. I think people that typically yell often haven't 
they hear the, the the first bit of the sound, as in they hear the the chesty quality. They mm-hmm. don't know. They don't necessarily. They're not necessarily listening out beneath that for the sense of of uh, release in the sound or the sense of other qualities in the sound that oh. that are sympathetic to the release. Versus, mm-hmm. if you lose the release, you can still hear that bright chesty quality, but it there's something missing from the sound. But that thing missing is not. It's not right at the front of the sound. It's it's within the sound in a more complex kind of way. Right. This type of thing. I remember having lessons and going back and listening to my favourite singers, and all of a sudden hearing, ah, they're not. They weren't doing what I thought they were doing. That the, mm-hmm. there's more to the sound. There's more to what they're doing than I thought. And and you can hear it in the way they're the technique but also in the outcome of the technique the sounds that they make have more character in them Mm -hmm. um this type of thing um yeah my my sense is that it is extremely hard to teach this stuff to yourself Mm -hmm. you can get you can uh, i've had a i'm probably I've had some supplement and mostly on my own. And when I think back, I could have saved myself a lot of time, got to the same end point much quicker if I'd have had the money to spend uh, with the types of coaches I'd like and this type of thing. But um, there is, I think it's possible to do as as you as an adult as a, and a struggling singer. But I think it's much it's much easier to do it on your own when you're younger. You've got more time. You typically are more able to really sit down and start getting into the nitty-gritty of details and things like that it's the same reason why people who learn an accent as sorry learn a language as an adult have an accent Mm -hmm. because they just if you learn an learning language as a child you will sit there and you will really hone in on you know tiny differences and you'll spend a lot more time on very small differences in pronunciation of this vowel or that vowel and it's da, just da, da. listening and listening yeah and um whereas the adults they uh they've they've got certain disadvantages but um i think that it's not necessarily the case that it's just the there's there's a lot of reasons why adults find it trickier not just um, you know, because you know they may learn more slowly than kids. Like there's maybe there's something to that, I'm sure. But also, there's other reasons behind it. Kids just have a lot more time. They're more open in their personality, typically as well. That helps them a ton. It's usually adults who've had the time to really close down and get very fearful. Kids mm-hmm. have not had that time. There's all mm-hmm. sorts of deeper reasons for why why this would happen. But yeah, it's um, it's. The, the great thing about learning to sing when you're older, though, is it teaches you a hell of a lot of, about parts of life that you p- possibly weren't even aware of your entire life mm-hmm. up to that point. Things about your personality that you didn't even know were off center mm-hmm. and uh, you didn't know. I didn't know that I was had very low self-esteem when I started singing. I didn't know that I had very low confidence when I started singing. I knew that my confidence was a bit lower than normal, but I didn't know how low it was till I really got into singing and started to see lots of different types of people and lots of different types of singers and really understand where I was at relative to, to quote unquote normal or more central as a, as a person. And um, it can be very profound in this sense because all of a sudden you get this barometer of, it's a very good barometer of where somebody's at in terms of their just basic comfort level in themselves, as an example. Mm-hmm. And and without that barometer, you can often assume that you're a normal person when anything, you, you could actually be anything but that. Now, mo- most people are roughly average, you know, most people are relatively comfortable, but you do get harder cases who are, you know, pretty far away from, from the norm and don't not aren't necessarily aware of it singing right. can help these people a lot it can actually heal them um, and really help them rebalance their whole life in a sense that's that's my experience well it's funny that you should say that because most people don't realize this but um the whole reason well i should say a large part of the reason why i decided to go on the singing journey was actually for a spiritual journey that that's that was my initial at first, when I was, um, how old was I? 
like around 13 when I decided that I wanted to be a singer. It was just initially to impress girls and, and, and just to say like, oh, I just want to get better at this. But then when I got around age, I want to say 16 or 17, and I really, because at that around 13 was when I really started like trying to learn more. I was going around asking every singer I knew, but how do you do this? How do you sing that? No, how, how are you getting the strength behind your voice when you do that? And, and how, how, how are you doing it? And I just say, well, you just open your mouth and you push. And I tried and, nope, not, not for me. <laughs> so um, as I started looking up information online, and at this time, this is when the internet was in its infancy, so there was very little information online at this time. So the little pieces here and there that I found online, a lot of it was on message boards, um, largely coming from either voice teachers who were um, – involved in these like news groups or your email list type things or um or sometimes it would be the students interacting with those teachers but i would read messages like that and i'm then reading encyclopedias and reading these you know books that were written on voice and and that's how i began to learn all this and i realized what in the world did i just step into i'm like <laughs> i feel like i just stepped into a mess that is just like religion it's like well, this person over here says that they have the truth, and this person over here says that they also have the truth, and this one says that their way is the right way. And it's like, well, how do you know who's right and who's wrong? So I felt like I was on a parallel journey with singing and religion at the same time. And I said, okay, this religion one is way more complex. I'm just going to put that to the side for now and focus more on the singing one. And my whole thing was about I want to find truth, in whatever way it presents itself to me. And I also want to find harmony and balance within myself because I feel like my voice is a very um, intimate part of who you are on, on, on so many different levels. It is a representation of who you are on many levels. And I wanted to find balance within that. And that's what basically started this whole journey for me so everything that you're saying there it, it basically lines up with everything that i've experienced and that you know it, it does unveil many things about your personality to you it that's how i started learning about my diet that's how i started learning about sleep habits that's how i started learning about how to exercise because certain ways of exercising i mean like going to the gym will influence your voice negatively or influence your voice positively there are you know, um, environmental things that are going on that you have to start paying attention to, you know, you start paying attention to your, your interactions with people. Like it's really interesting that there are certain people that all of a sudden when I get in front of them and I have, if I have to, if I would have to sing in front of them, namely my family, all of a sudden, if I, even if I could do things prior, get in front of this set of people, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> yeah. This, I, I this, would have the same thing in front of my family as well. Um, this is like a weird thing. You can you can literally sing. You can you rehearse something for for months and months, and you can li you can be able to sing it perfectly every single time, a hundred times out of a hundred. You won't make a mistake in six months, and then you put you in a different environment, and it can mm -hmm. feel almost impossible. Mm -hmm. That's why I always tell singers that I'm working with. I say, okay, now that now that we've got the song down, now here, now okay. I need you to go perform this live somewhere. I said, as soon as you perform it live, you're going to have a different set of habits that's going to kick in. And I need to know what those habits are so we can finish working on this. Just being able to sing it by yourself. And, and I'm like, that's good, but that's not done. It's not done until you actually assess what do you actually do when you're on stage? Do you start over breathing all of a sudden when you're on stage? Do you start singing with these wrong sound colors when you're on stage? Like, I need to know what is it that you actually do when you're in front of people. Mm -hmm. Once you get that solved, then you're at a good place. Yeah, when you're under pressure, you typically go back to your old habits or your old way. You, uh, mm -hmm. You're much more likely to. So um, those old memories will kick in more. Um, yeah, this has been this has been really good, Marnell. Um, I've kind of got to go. I've got other things I need to do. We've had a good hour and a half. Uh, I've got. Okay. So uh, I'll snip a, little, some f a few bits out of this when uh, we had phones ringing and doors banging. But other than that, uh, it's going to be flowed very well. So um, do you have any closing thoughts or anything you want to finish up with? 
Um, the closing thoughts that I would say is, um, for those of you who have questions, you know, I do respond to emails on my website. I may not, um, be able to get to all of them right away, but I do, um, respond to them. My website is vocalliberation.com. Um, you can also visit my YouTube channel. For those of you who are trying to study um, voice on your own and, you know, you, for whatever reason, that's just your preferred route. The one program that I would recommend would be Phil Mufarich's program because it sidesteps the um, some of the issues that I mentioned earlier because he does give you direct feedback on what you're doing with your voice. Like he re insists that you do that, that as soon as you buy his program, that it's not good enough to just do the exercises. He's like, okay, I need to hear what you sound like doing this exercise, post a clip. And then he will tell you, okay, this exercise is appropriate for you right now. This one, stop doing that one, do this other one over here. And then, you know, you keep making changes like that as you go along. So for the person who wants to go the self-study route, I would say, get his program if you can't work with the teacher. But yeah, those are basically my closing remarks. Awesome. Yeah, I will put your links in the description of the video as well. Um, when you said the singer that wants to go the self-study route, uh, I think it would be more accurate to say the ma the masochist that wants to go the self-study <laughs> route. Because <laughs> you have to enjoy pain to, to do self-study. Uh, uh, even you have to win. I think you have to have a, be a certain degree of... Uh, masochist to uh even to to take on the challenge of singing because it's very difficult but yeah it's um it's uh it's brave anyone that does this is a bra brave person it's a little bit like you know when uh what's the saying boxers have when they say um you know they kind of respect anyone that will get in the ring it's 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 a similar type of thing you know uh really anyone that's got the the kind of nerve to sing and have a real go at it is uh it's probably one of the toughest endeavors not just because it's very very difficult but also because of the the types of cultural norms we have around singing the types of normal values we have around singing uh make it uh, more difficult and things and yeah so uh anyone out there singing best of luck to you uh and i will put yeah i'll put all your links in the description my now thank you so much for this i'm not sure when it go up later this week though certainly um awesome man